grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're wrapping up the book of Jonah this week. And I think out of all four chapters of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4 is probably the most exciting one, yet also probably one of the most confusing ones. If you just kind of listen to it, read, and I just read it a little bit ago, it, it can kind of be a little bit confusing. So we're going to dig into that, hopefully understand what God has for us by his prophet Jonah in Jonah chapter 4 here. But I want to just kind of wrap up real quick how we got here. Remember, Jonah was a prophet, right, called by God to go to Nineveh, right, the city of his arch enemies, to proclaim out against them. And what did Jonah do? Did he go to Nineveh? Not at first, right? He went and he hopped on a boat and he went to the other side of the known world, started headed for Tarshish, but God pursued him. There was a great tempest, a great storm on the sea, the boat was breaking apart, and he begged the sailors of the boat to throw him into the sea where he would face his certain death. We talked about how Jonah would probably rather die than go to Nineveh. But our God is slow to anger, full of mercy, abounding in steadfast love, and God comes and he rescues Jonah in the belly of a great fish. The great fish swallows Jonah. That's everybody's favorite part. You remember that one from Sunday school when you were a kid. He's in the belly of the whale or the great fish for three days and three nights. And then God causes the great fish to vomit Jonah up on the dry land. And God has used this great fish to turn Jonah's heart. So that once again Jonah can have a second chance and go to Nineveh. And we saw last week in Jonah chapter 3, Jonah goes to Nineveh. And he preaches the worst sermon ever preached by any prophet, where he tells the Ninevites, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. But God uses this word, right? And all of a sudden, all the Ninevites, all of those evil people, including the king, repent and they turn back to God. And Jonah chapter 3 ends with God relenting of his anger and not bringing destruction upon Nineveh. That's where we are when Jonah chapter 4 begins. And when Jonah chapter 4 begins, how do you think Jonah feels? Is he rejoicing because they've repented? No, 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 no. Jonah is ticked, right? And he lets God know it. Jonah chapter 4, this is how it begins. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. All right, what, what is Jonah, who does Jonah sound like? Right? A toddler not getting his way, right? He's like, God, I, I, I knew it, God! Right, this isn't fair, God. I knew it! I knew you were going to show mercy to those good-for-nothing Ninevites. I knew it! For you're slow to anger, full of mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Have you ever heard God described that way? Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In fact, all the time throughout the Old Testament, right, we refer to God that way, slow to anger, full of mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Jonah knew this, right? There's, there's all sorts of, of psalms, there's all sorts of other parts of Scripture. Here in Exodus, we have it. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, keeping steadfast love for thousands. Right? That's the nature of God. And Jonah knew that. And he was upset. He said, God, I knew you were going to be merciful. I knew you were going to be gracious. Jonah had experienced that for himself as God was gracious and merciful to him. But now he'd rather die right, than see the Ninevites, his enemies, experience that mercy. So what does God do, right? God is slow to anger, 
full of mercy and abounding in steadfast love. And we see this with how he deals with this toddler of Jonah throwing a temper tantrum. He tries to get him back three different ways. The first way, right, he goes to Jonah, and he asks Jonah a question. He tries to reason with Jonah in the middle of his temper tantrum, right? Doesn't go too well. Right? He says, Jonah, does it do well for you, Jonah, to be angry with me? And Jonah wants nothing to do with God's questioning, wants nothing to do with reason. He continues to throw his temper tantrum, and he goes outside of the city where he builds a booth or a shelter, depending on your translation, and he sits there and he looks over the city to see what God's going to do to the city. Now, what do you think Jonah thought God would do or should do to Nineveh as he's sitting out there under this little booth or this shelter on a hill in the middle of the scorching sun? Remember his sermon? Right? 40 days, Nineveh will be overturned or overthrown. Right? So what do you think Jonah thought was going to happen? They'd be destroyed, right? Maybe that's what he was hoping would happen. Now here's just a, a, a fun little uh, Hebrew lesson for you, right? The word overturned or overthrown in Hebrew is hapak, right? You can say it, hapak. It's kind of a fun word to say which simply means to turn over, right? So Nineveh will be turned over or overthrown. And it, there's times in the Bible where hapak means to overthrow as in like destroy. But there's also times in the Bible when overturned can be a good thing, right? There's Psalms that say, God, you have hapak my mourning and my grief. You have overturned mourning and grief and turned it into joy. So hapak, sort of the flipping over or the turning over can be kind of a bad thing to a good thing as well. How do you think Jonah intended this message of God to go? Probably one of destruction. How did God overturn them? He turned them from their evil ways back to God, a joyful thing. Kind of a funny play on words. But anyway, Jonah's there on the edge of a hill overlooking Nineveh, waiting for them to be destroyed. Wants nothing to do with God. He'd rather die than, do, than see his enemies experience mercy from his God. So God comes to him again. And we'll call this one the leafy plant approach. God causes this, this leafy plant to go up over Jonah to provide some great shade for him from the sun. And for the first time in the entire book of Jonah, Jonah is exceedingly joyful. He's exceedingly glad because of this plant that's come up overnight. But then, the next day, God has a sense of humor. God sends this tiny little worm to eat the bottom of the plant, and the plant withers and dies. And once again, Jonah is ticked. Once again, Jonah wants to die. And God comes to him again, a third time here. And basically says, Jonah, does it do well for you to be angry about the plant? Right? And Jonah responds to God. And says, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Right? Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? And you might say, whoa, well, hold on a second. How does, how does this end? Like, what happens? This is the end of the book of Jonah, right there. Right? There's 120,000 people who don't know their right hand and their left, and a lot of cattle. Like, what? What's, what's, what's going on? Like, But God here causes this leafy plant to grow and looks at Jonah and says, Jonah, you care so much about this plant. Like, you, you didn't cause the plant to grow. 
you didn't toy, uh, you didn't like sow the seed, you didn't till the soil, you didn't do any of that stuff. It just appeared and then it disappeared and you care so much about this plant. God's saying, there's a city down there with over 120,000 people and a lot of cattle, right? We can kind of laugh, right, about the livestock that are there and all these animals that are down there. God's like, I, I made those people. Sure, they might not know their right hand from their left hand. Sure, they might be evil, but, but I made them. I formed them. I care about them. Do I not have a right to love them and care for them and show them mercy? And this is where everybody asks, well, what does Jonah do? And we don't know, right? The last thing we know is Jonah is sitting there angry with God on the side of a hill outside of Nineveh with a sunburned head, right? And, and, and that's the big question. What, what is Jonah going to do? Right? How is Jonah going to respond when he finds out that God loves his enemy? That God cares for his enemy just as much as he cares for him? And I think that's a good question for us to ask. It's a deep question for us to ask. How do you respond knowing that God loves your enemy? Knowing that God is full of mercy and grace and abounding in steadfast love, not just for you, but also that person that you hate. It's kind of the scandalous side of God's grace. It's something I think we don't like to wrestle with that much. It made me think of a man by the name of Gordon Wilson. Anybody remember him? Anybody remember him at all from the 1980s? Gordon Wilson was a man. Uh, he lived in Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland in the 1980s um, was the whole, the IRA and the, the sort of, I don't know, almost civil war terrorism things that was going on there with the IRA, bombing different areas where the Irish and the British weren't really getting along. I was very young at this time. I don't remember this, but I, I've read about it. And Gordon Wilson was an Irishman living in Northern Ireland. He didn't support the IRA. He was a Christian. Simply was a man who made drapes, um, curtains for homes, he had a family, and on a certain Remembrance Day, Remembrance Day is like the equivalent of our Memorial Day, where they remember the soldiers who, uh, who gave their lives in World War I and World War II. And on this Remembrance Day, his town um, city, city center, the town center where he was living, was having a big uh, Remembrance Day parade and celebration. So he and his daughter went down to the town center for this Remembrance Day celebration. And while he was there, the IRA decided to bomb the town square. So before he realized this, all of a sudden the, the, uh, the, um, the buildings sort of came crashing down upon him and he and his daughter were stuck under the buildings for, for several hours, I believe, before the rescue crews could get in. And, and, and the sad thing is, is Gordon Wilson, he survived but his daughter did not. And the BBC, of course, was covering this, went into the hospital where he was, and this is where the entire world met Gordon Wilson, was from his hospital bed. And he gave an interview about what had just happened. And in 1987, this interview went viral, right? It got retweeted like crazy. Well, it didn't get retweeted like crazy, but it, it went viral in that every single major news outlet in the entire new known world played this interview. And now you can watch, if you go to the BBC's website, you can watch this interview of him from his hospital room. But I found an article online that was reflecting back over this interview. And it said, speaking from his hospital bed, Wilson described his last conversation with his daughter. I want to read from this article here. It said, she held my hand tightly and gripped me as hard as she could. She said, Daddy, I love you very much. Those were her exact words to me, and those were the last words I ever heard her say. 
But to the astonishment of the listeners, Wilson went on to add, but I will bear no ill will. I will bear no grudge. Bitter talk is not going to bring her back to life. I will pray tonight and every night for the men who did this that God will forgive them. The article reflecting back on this says, no words in more than 25 years of violence in Northern Ireland had such a powerful emotional impact. See, Gordon Wilson was a Christian. He knew there was a different way to live towards your enemy. He understood the grace that Jesus had given to him. And he prayed for his enemies, these people who had just taken his daughter's life. Now the world, right, when this interview went out there, most people were not too happy with him. In fact, he got hate mail from people. He got hate mail from other Christians even, saying, how could you say you're going to pray for these evil people? Right? You know, there was other people that died there too, not just your daughter. How, how can you be so selfish and actually pray for them? Right? Because the ways of the world says, when you do something evil, right, you need to be evil in return, right? So if, if your enemy does something to you, right, maybe they say a lie about you or a fib about you, what does the world say you need to do, right? Paint them as a pathological liar. Go tell everybody how horrible that person is, right, so that they won't be harmed by them at all, right? You need to distance them. You need to paint them as this evil person, right? That becomes their identity, the evil thing that they've done, right? And look at our world today right? Look at our world today. Just listen to the news today. What is the news trying to get you to see, especially the 24-hour news cycle? They're trying to get you to see the other side as evil, right? Whatever side you're on, they're trying to get you to see the other side as evil, as your enemy, right? And, and, and maybe you scroll through your Facebook feed and you see somebody on the other side of the political spectrum as you, and you see them post something. How do you feel? Do you look at them and say, man, that man or woman, they're, they're a woman created by God that God loves dearly? Or do you say, man, what a, can you believe what they're posting? Look how, I can't stand them. I don't even think I can be their friend anymore. Right? The, the world tells us that we need to, to push people away that are our enemies. Yet there's a different way. Right? Jesus comes into the world and brings a different way for us and for our enemies. You know what Jesus says? He says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. This is something that Gordon Wilson knew and understood as he very publicly on international television said, I pray for the men that did this. You see, we are enemies of God. We all have these characteristics of evil things that we do. I have them, you have them, your enemy has them. And God doesn't come into the world saying, ha, 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 I'm going to push you further away from me. Jesus comes into the world where he dies for you and those things that make you an enemy of God. He hangs on the cross and dies for you because he is slow to anger, full of mercy and abounding in steadfast love. God loves you that much that he takes on your evil, he takes on your sin, and he dies from it and he's raised to life from it for you. And also for your enemy, right? So that our identity no longer is somebody defined by our good or evil characteristics, but we're defined by what Christ has done for us, where he's slow to anger, full of mercy, and abounding in steadfast love. You are now a friend of God because of Jesus. So the question is, right, what does that mean for you as you relate to your enemy in life? That's the question that Jonah gets to at the end of Jonah chapter 4. So I want you guys to have a little homework assignment here, right? Kind of wrap up. The I want you to think of that person that you hate, right? And don't say, I don't hate anybody. Everybody has an enemy, 
right? Everybody has somebody, even if they're the nicest person in the world, they have somebody that they, they, they dislike, they're displeased with. Think of that person. Right? And then think of all the characteristics for why you don't like them. And then go before God. Right? Go before God and ask yourself honestly if you display any of those same characteristics. Right? And then ask God what he does for you. And as you see that your God is slow to anger, full of mercy, and abounding in steadfast love, ask yourself the question of what that means for you as you relate to this one person. That's what Jonah's all about. Amen.